Ladies and gentlemen, today, Jeff Kurdakis, the CEO of the popular project TrustSwap and founder of the decentralized social platform Uptrend, join me on the channel to talk about a ton of hot topics in crypto. So let's dive right in here. So first of all, could you just give folks a background on uh, how you got in the crypto space and what you've worked on in the past? Yeah, um, I got into crypto around 2016 when a friend was trying to kind of get me into Bitcoin. But then through Bitcoin is where I discovered Ethereum. And I wasn't too over enthused about Bitcoin at the time. But when I discovered Ethereum, I was like, this is like literally a game changer. How we can literally shift power from like centralized corporations back to the people, like build a completely new financial system, a governance system. So I was just like, this is crazy. So I started a little Facebook group with uh, me and 12 of my friends. And um, from there, that group grew to 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Now it's expanded into a network of about like half a million people. So it's just been like this like big organic thing where I've just been like so enthralled by what cryptocurrency can do for people and, and how it can really change our landscape and the way that we live in our world in so many ways. So I've just kind of been like being guided down this path. Like I, I just, I can't stop. It's a little bit of an addiction in the best way. Hey, it's a good addiction. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. And so I guess that that it would be, would it be fair to say that that community that you created on Facebook really inspired your self-funded project in Uptrend, I would assume. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Um, with Uptrend, you know, the Facebook algorithm was just so terrible and everyone's complaining about, you know, being censored and, you know, they were at that time, they were really censoring a lot of crypto things as well. Like, you know, you can't do ads for crypto. That was kind of like getting into the yeah. 2017 time. And then I was looking around, I'm like, okay, well, what do we have? And we had Steam it at the time. And I'm like, Steam it's really cool, actually. Like, I, I really liked yeah. Steam it back then. But the problem that I found was it was really an oligarchy where, you know, if you put a bunch of Steam, then you could power up. And it was like a, it was like an old boys club. And I found that, you know, if you're new to the platform, you weren't really going to be able to have any exposure, any weight, like unless you like rubbed, rubbed elbows with someone, there was no chance you're going to get any momentum. So I was like, we, I, there's got to be a better solution. So that's, that was like a big ethos for why Uptrend was started or like a, a gap in the market that I saw. Yeah, and I guess mechanically, Uptrend to me, uh, and I have limited experience, I actually need to take more advantage of Uptrend, you know, from a content perspective, but it feels a lot like uh, a Reddit with a different backbone. Like the whole, the content distribution is different, but the, the feel of it is very similar to me. Definitely, yeah. We're looking to kind of move even more so into like a Reddit Twitter hybrid. So, because with Reddit, I find like, you know, you're scrolling the main feed and you have to click yeah. into everything, which is fine, but we want to kind of also make it like, you know, you can just like cruise and scroll. So we'll have the 200, I think we already do have the 280 character um, kind of like preview window. And then if you want to see more, you know, pop, pop into the post. So that's kind of the idea. And then obviously with a lot more sound foundational principles than uh, Reddit and Twitter both, you know, like freedom of speech is like paramount, monetization yeah. of your content uh, and, and privacy or security of your data. So, you know, you're not, getting all your data just mined and sold to the highest bidder it's in your control yeah definitely and i think you would be a great person to ask this question and this is a topic that i think comes up in a lot of these types of conversations and that's like the the fine line between you know where does the the freedom of speech start bleeding into like creating platforms that are enabling towards you know crime and other things i think that's where people struggle when they're building these platforms like how do we do the right thing on both uh, on both sides of that coin you know yeah this this is a five-hour conversation in itself yeah, yeah, um yeah. like kind of the, the way that i see it is if it's legal in the jurisdiction that your company is domiciled in then it should be able to be spoken I, my, my kind of ethos is Everybody has freedom of speech, but everybody should also have freedom to not have to hear what that other person is saying. And I think that's the big caveat because, you know, you get a lot of people just like forcing their opinions down people's throats. It's like, listen, yeah. you can have that opinion, but, you know, don't force it on others. I think, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, this ideology is right and this ideology is wrong. And I think that is like the... I think that in itself is wrong. I think all of these ideologies and thought processes come from just like our own inherent upbringing and psychology and everyone has different 
political views or socioeconomic views based on their current circumstance. Um, so I think that it's super crucial to have a platform where all sides of the spectrum can be heard out. Otherwise, you're essentially creating this like massive monopoly or dictatorship on what is right in the world. And I think once we start limiting people's freedom of expression, that's a really dangerous slippery slope where there's just like the big algorithm overlord that just feeds you what you want to see and shapes your personality yeah. into something. So yeah, that was a long answer to say uh, freedom of speech is badass. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I, and I think it's, it, you know, it's, it's an unenviable problem for social platforms that exist already and then new ones that are coming into the into the space trying to you know to solve for that equation uh, which is a it's a delicate balance but i do think that when you give people the tools both both as creators and consumers to say you know we're going to do our best to within the bounds of the law almost self-police content i do think that there are like the really insidious stuff that is out there i think would get policed on its own in a way and it, that's kind of how it used to be in the early days of of like youtube and stuff yeah there would be there would be the inevitable bad stuff that showed up like clearly unethical stuff and it would get self-policed pretty quickly yeah and that's kind of the interesting thing you know you look at a platform like youtube or facebook and they only have an upvote because you know you want to feed the dopamine receptors you don't want to yeah. receive the downvote because oh no your dopamine is going to get shut down but i feel like that's a massive vulnerability because you know, these, or even Twitter as well, like you see these snarky, sarcastic comments and, you know, you get a little laugh out of them. You know, they're not maybe like, eh, not the most morally sound thing to be laughing at, but you throw a like on it anyways. Yeah. And then it becomes this self-perpetuating game of negativity. And so a system that I feel is really important is to be able to be like, to say, to stand up for something and be like, no, I don't agree with that type of speech and hit it with a down vote. Um, so that's what we have on Uptrend as well. And then we also have a little bit of like a uh, ranking or weighting system. So if you're new to the platform and you're just there to troll, you know, your comments aren't going to get or your upvote doesn't have as much power. So it's, it's like a, an intelligently designed system so that um, there's freedom of speech and exposure for everybody. But at the same time, you're not going to be... Uh, you're not going to get like censored or everyone has like the ability to kind of express themselves openly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think every, everything that was good in, in theory or good on principle or intended um, to be good can turn quite bad. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't think that the, the ideals behind some of these bigger social media platforms making these moves that are now like basically bona fide censorship. I don't think that those were purposeful, censorship moves i think that these were business decisions right it's like we need to we need to make this small step to help our business and then it's really easy like you said it's a slippery slope yeah. it's really easy to go overboard yeah like an interesting one for me was youtube and how they were like if there's something that goes against uh, the world health organization in regards to coronavirus we are going to take it down so if you're like hey orange juice can help cure coronavirus like you know xyz yeah. Uh, they're like, we're taking that down. And to me, that's a little crazy because I understand like there's like the perspective of YouTube, which is like, okay, we need to protect people. And so they don't have like Trump saying, you know, inject bleach into your arm and then everyone's doing it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But in the same breath, it's like, but how can you, now you're trusting a central authority on news about health when the World Health Organization itself has been flip-flopping all over the place. So it's like, for me, that's, that was like a perfect example of why freedom of speech is so crucially important because when you're trusting one entity, there's always going to be uh, perspectives that are missed. Yeah, and I don't think there's a, I don't think there's even a concrete, you know, it's not black and white, much like the, you know, the actual content. There's not like a real definitively correct approach to this problem because no matter what, there's always going to be drawbacks to what you do. And so I think it's just it's going to be an ongoing challenge from from here on out now that the world is so driven by uh, or the availability of people's opinions and thoughts are so much more uh, prevalent and pervasive. I think it's now something we have to contend with for from now on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's I fully agree with that. As our lives continue to move more and more digital, I think these types of conversations are becoming more and more important. And I unfortunately think a lot of people get complacent 
they're just like, oh, you know, Apple is easy. And one of my favorite things, well, not favorite, it's like, it's sad really. It's like, everyone's like, oh, Bill Gates is microchipping everyone with this new vaccine. And he's gonna track our locations. I'm like, yo, you got a phone in your pocket, man. You're already microchipped. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like everyone's- yeah, it's much too late. Exactly. It's like, we'll, we'll sign up for it voluntarily, but don't force it on us. It's, I don't know. It's this hilarious dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the it's the same folks often that are you know signing up for uh, you know different websites with the same password you know exactly yeah with an email that gives their last name it's like you know <laughs> yeah. these these things are are um, it's multifaceted yeah you, know? um, you can do there's a lot of stuff that you can do and I don't want to open up this can of worms but there are a lot of things that you can do for yourself that are not going to get in the way of your user experience day to day that you can do to protect your privacy yeah and to uh, you know, watch out for yourself. There's a lot of, of good things out there. Totally. Here's maybe a, a password tip that I like to use for maybe anybody watching, but like, let's say if you're sure. using, cause you know, everyone like wants to keep an easy password, yeah. uh, but they don't, want, they don't want to have to remember a thousand passwords and there's like the balance. So what you can do is, let's say you're signing up to Facebook and your password is doglover46 or whatever. So it'd be like doglover46 and then you always remember what letters in Facebook you're going to use next. So for example, you, you'll use like the last letter and then the first letter. So it'd be like dog lover 46 K F. And then yeah. no matter what platform you sign up to, you always know that combination. But if you ever get key logged, well, you'll never be able to get it replicated because the person who's key logging, you won't really know what you're up to. Yeah. I've, I've also used, and, and this can get long if you're on a certain website, but I'll use uh, mnemonics the same way. So I'll take, you know, if it's Facebook, I'll take F-A-C-E and I'll create a phrase, like a sentence uh, out of, with the first letter being F-A-C-E. Right. Because it's it's easy for me to remember because it's a sentence, right? It's something that you can recite in your head and you're, you got it for life, right. basically. Um, and then you'll always remember which one it is based on those letters. <laughs> for sure, so, yeah. Yeah, those are so many cool little tricks. And I mean, if you if you struggle, just get a password manager, then you have to remember one you know, that's your password and you're good. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But um, I guess this there's not an easy way to segue, but I did really want to talk about trust swap because there's so much going on in the DeFi space. Yeah. And I think that's the best place to start. What are your thoughts on on DeFi and the crazy growth that's happening? Like I'm like re reliving the ICO period with this be the beginnings of DeFi. Yeah, when you can lock up half a billion dollars into, uh, what was the one that, oh, what was that coin that just- Yam? I don't, was it Yam that got half a billion locked in? I mean, yeah, it must have been. And then there was another, yeah. yeah it was like it was close Yam. to 500 mil. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so that like that blows my mind. And then like right before was Tendies, which is still like a $10 million <laughs> market cap coin. Yeah. And like, it's all this like crazy game theory with tokenomics and yield farming. And it's like, it is really just this like big game of Ponzi scheme chicken in a lot of senses. It's like, okay, like how high are we gonna try to ride this thing before everyone starts cashing out? But I mean, that's, that's kind of the negative side. Like I think it is mm -hmm. really a lot of hype, but there is so much cool stuff in regards to DeFi, like it, the lending side of things. And just this morning, I believe I need to do a little more research, but they announced like, they're like kind of putting mortgages in with DeFi as well and integrating that. Yeah. So now using like a mortgage as collateral or lending against that, like the, the possibilities are really getting endless here. Um, and so I'm excited for ETH 2.0 to start scaling because <laughs> once that happens, DeFi is gonna be just absolutely unstoppable. So I don't think it's unwarranted all this DeFi hype. I think right yeah. now we're just seeing a lot of ex like fun experimentation. Yeah, and I think to that end, you know, there were a lot of projects that I, I think the whole the whole concept of an ICO encouraged companies to sell a narrative and to sell an idea before they had anything. Like there were there was no right. there wasn't even a GitHub repository right. where people were selling tokens. I think DeFi is different in the sense that you kind of have to have a product that does something for anyone to even contribute and and buy anything. You know what I mean? Because you're not really buying your you're paying fees or you're, you know, paying interest or earning interest, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Something I, I love the ILOs that have been coming out recently because it like with ICOs, you're usually locked in or there's a vesting period or X, Y, Z. And, you know, you, you put your money, you wait 30 days and then you get your tokens with ILOs. You know, it's like, hey, here's you, like Uniswap is I love Uniswap. 
and it's like you can invest and okay you know teams you know keeping keeping the wheels moving great keep it in or uh, you know the team's not delivering I'm just gonna take it right out so yeah, Uniswap's unbelievable man like I'm looking at Uniswap like for trust swap honestly Uniswap is doing I think over 12 times more volume than any other exchange that we're on and that includes like Poloniex, Gate.io, okay. MXC it's like decentralized exchanges are taking over the world uh, rightly so. I mean, I think there. I think the biggest challenge was making these these like these dexes easy to use, yeah. right? Like to make them feel normal to use, and then also to make them, um, I guess, to reach feature parity with these centralized exchanges. But it's like now it's like it's a no brainer to use Uniswap instead of waiting for an exchange. I think I saw a tweet of yours the other day. It was like all these people asking for big exchanges to list a coin. Like it's. <laughs> It's so much harder and so much costlier to do that than people realize. And so you'll end up waiting forever and you'll miss the boat because you were waiting for a centralized exchange to put it on. Yeah, I think that's the, one of the biggest misconceptions in all of crypto. It, or not a misconception, but like a false flag or false standard. They're like, oh, when centralized exchanges happen, then the project has validity. It's like, well, yeah. That just means the project's wasted money, more or less. I mean, like yeah. there are values in centralized exchanges, like limit orders, margin trading, uh, leverage trading, and maybe like fiat on ramps and stuff. But I think that's pretty much where it ends. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited for that rhetoric to shift because for any new project entering the space, it's like such a cata like just monumental pressure on the shoulders. Like list here, list there. I'm like. You guys have no idea how much this is costing the project and how much more leverage we can have if we allocate this funding towards business development. Then that's when you all the all the holders are really going to be happy. Um, not just these weird exchange listings. I haven't seen an exchange listing, uh, in my experience, provide positive price movement yet. I know, you know, it happens when you like. I won't name exchange names. But this happens a lot. So let's say you're about to list on a big exchange. That big exchange will say, listen, we need you to have a market maker on your token and you need to suppress the price for the two weeks leading up to your listing. When you list, you need to pump it. Take all that allocation and just throw it in. And so it's like, oh, exchange listings are amazing. When I list on this exchange, and I think that has like just really become a cancer in the industry because now everyone thinks exchange listings are magical when really, yeah, they're more manipulative than anything. Yeah, it's it's like illusory. And look, like I, I I'm I get stoked about an exchange listing where it's like okay, it, it's easy to fall into that trap. Is I think my sure. point where you think about it like this is a you know an okay go like a. a this is an exchange saying, I believe in this project. Right. It's really not an endorsement. No. Like, the reason they're listing it is because they make money. Exactly. Like, this this isn't a cut against, I mean, there are plenty of things you can say against Coinbase, but this isn't really a cut against them. It's just like, it's a smart business model. Like all the coins that they're listing are coins that offer staking because they know people are too lazy to do the really easy process to set up staking for themselves. So it's right. like easy month over month revenue generation for coinbase and so it's like whenever there's a new hot staking coin expect it to show up on coinbase not right. because they love the concept but because they love the concept of making money off of staking for people <laughs> yeah <you know? laughs> like, yeah but it, it is what it is i think that there is a lot there is something to be said for having this like really easy clean fiat on ramp for people mm -hmm. because that's still a thing that i think people struggle with because most people just don't wake up and then have Bitcoin or Ether laying around to start using DEXs and, and that sort of thing. For sure. So it'll take time for it to be that ubiquitous. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for the day. And I mean, like all the, all the like that needs to happen is um, oh, I'm trying to think of some of the names of like these fiat on ramps. Um, ah, they're all blank in my mind, but there's tons that I'm sure you could just like put a little API plug in on a decentralized mm -hmm. exchange and boom, 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 little bit of coding and off you go. So like I think, mm -hmm. yeah. And then also there are already uh, like decentralized exchanges that offer margin trading, leverage trading and uh, limit orders as well. So it's like all these things are there. They're just like taking a little bit of time to get some some wheels under them. And yeah, I think that's that's the golden goose, man. Like once we have DEXs that 
kind of tick all the boxes of centralized exchanges. And meanwhile, they're global and they don't cost any listing fees to get on. And there's no yeah. KYC. It's like, oh, that's that's how to do it. Game over. I mean, I, I think that financial institutions that are smart, right, that are starting to, you know, lean forward. And I think there's the I guess like the regulatory path is starting to open for traditional finance to start kind of playing in this space. They would be smart to just bypass all the centralized, you know, intermediaries where they can't make a lot of money and just say, we're going to we're going to supply a stable coin sort of gateway to DEXs. And so if you have money in your account at Schwab, for example, yeah. you can convert that to USDC and then you can port that into, uh, you know, into a DEX and we'll just we'll take a small fee and just call it a day and just bypass the exchanges. Totally, man. And I think that, I, in my opinion, that's a big, has been a large catalyst for a little bit of the recent bull run is banks started announcing, I think in the USA, is that they're going to be allowing for crypto custody. So you could like walk into your bank, be like, yo, I want to I want to buy a Bitcoin. Boom, you've done it. And it's in your bank account. And so, you know, yeah. you talk about like Coinbase, like that's that's like crypt, crypto for dummies or crypto for normies, however you want to say it. And uh, yeah. I think like banking is going to be like that next step in because Coinbase has all their limitations of like 300 bucks a day or whatever it is. So, you know, yeah. people who just want to get in big, easy, um, I, I think it's monumental. Totally. It almost like it almost stands in the place of what everyone was begging for with an ETF. It's like you don't need an ETF. If right. You can get retail at your retail bank. Like You don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. So powerful stuff, man. Powerful stuff. And I guess, you know, getting to the topic that I know we were trying to get to before, which is trust swap. Can you just lay it out for people? Like what is trust swap? Like what what drove you to help build that uh, that product out? Totally. Yeah. So trust swap. It's essentially like an entire DeFi ecosystem that's being built. And that's like a pretty high level lavish thing to say. But we're focusing mm -hmm. on payments and token sale launch pads right now, as well as subscriptions, which kind of goes into payments. So just to kind of super high level, the different categories, say so yeah, like crypto subscriptions, so like imagine being able to pay for your Netflix or your Spotify with crypto, like that's what we're aiming to do, where you can pay in ETH, USDC, Tether, whatever. Um, just like link that in, super easy, like links into your Web3 wallet. Um, we have like different solutions for payments. So we're gonna be rocking escrow services. And that was the reason why I started the whole thing is I was trying to do a deal with a venture capital firm where I was gonna give them tokens for ETH. And they're like, hey, like, okay, who sends first? And okay, we need a middleman that's gonna cost 5%. I'm like, you're telling me there's not a smart contract for this thing? <laughs> I'm like, that's the yeah. simplest shit ever. I'm like, I gotta build it. So that was like, that was the first thing that happened from TrustSwap was that. Um, so escrow deal flow is absolutely massive. You know, people are trying to get like millions, if not billions of dollars of flow into it, through the crypto ecosystem. Uh, yeah. And so, it, there, but there's, they're using lawyers or these weird escrow services that charge high fees. It's like, man, just use a smart contract where you can boom, both agree on it, both see it. I think that's super yep. cool. And then uh, another one, like uh, there's tons of applications, but I'll just kind of dial in on the last one that people are really excited about, um, which is kind of like the launch pad ecosystem that we're doing. So we offer three software services um, mm -hmm. for projects who are like new or starting or want to kind of hyperdrive themselves. So the first one is team lock tokens. So again, nothing revolutionary, but there's just nothing out there that exists in the public domain that people can plug into. So, you know, team locks their tokens over a certain period of time. Investors are confident that they're not going to dump huge benefit all around. You can also lock up or vest investor tokens, which on one hand sounds like, you know, a, down, a you know, a downer. It's like, "Oh, I want to be able to dump when I can." But if you understand that everybody is in the same boat as you and everyone is vested over six months or one year and there isn't going to be a dump event, you can be like, OK, like this project has long term viability and I feel a lot more comfortable with this as an investment rather than like a little quick flip, which I think is very yeah. cool. And then uh, the third software piece that we're implementing on the launch pad is something called Dai COs. Now, Vitalik has been talking about these for a while. And essentially what it is is event-based payments. So let's say you're going to put $100,000 investment into a project, but that $100,000 doesn't go to the team all at once. They're going to get $10,000 
for every time they hit a predetermined milestone. And if they stop hitting milestones or they're hitting them too slow, you take your money out. And so whatever you've invested, you get the tokens for, but it de-risks, so like those three software pieces totally de-risk the uh, token sale launch pod side of things. And then just to quickly close and wrap it up, um, on the launch pad, um, all projects, anyone can use those three software pieces, but we also launch projects through our launch pad and like kind of like a token sale style thing, like a pre-sale. Um, mm -hmm. And to participate in that, people need to hold swap tokens to get in. So swap like has massive utility there. And not only that, but all projects that go through the launch pad um, have, are required to airdrop 2% of their entire total supply uh, to the swap holders. So it's a, uh, I, I, there's like so many different sectors like subscriptions, escrow and the launch pad and a ton of other things where people can check out on the website. But I'm just like, these are all multi, each one is a multi-billion dollar industry. And they're yeah. all like, to me, such low hanging fruit. Like each one, I'm like, how is this not done before? And uh, so I'm just excited to be rolling them out. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, I think the last the last thing that you said was was huge, and that's like you're sort of creating this um, incentivized contractual agreement between you as an investor and the team that you're investing in. My question to you is: is that how do you you know I guess provably tell that smart contract that otherwise has no idea what's going on in the real world? Like, is there some sort of oracle? plug in here or is there some sort of predetermined like arbitration built into it to tell like when they hit a milestone and when they didn't yeah yeah that's that's an awesome question because yeah for like you know team token locks investor token locks that's just like based on time there's you don't there's no variables in there or like real world interaction the only variable is yeah. time but with event-based payments like hey when we do uh when we post on forbes then we unlock 10 percent. for example it's like well, the blockchain doesn't interact with Forbes, for example. Yeah. So it's like, how do you how do you tell? And the answer is, you need in this instance, you need to create a system of or like a governance system of people who are verifying this. So we're still working out those exact details. Th that part isn't going to be in phase one of our launch, which is coming end of August. This will be maybe a few months down the road, uh, but that will be a group of people. Um, whether that group of people recycles, like we're still working out all those details, but it will be people yeah. that act as the oracle. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a problem that I'm super passionate about yeah. is that, you know, physical to digital world integration that I think is missing yeah. it is the missing link from like probably 60 to 70 percent. And that's being conservative of the crypto projects out there. It's like the idea is great, but you have to have that connection point or it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Definitely. So, with I, I guess with Trust Swap, another thing that's interesting is starting to you know almost provide a toolkit for uh, these these different projects that want to launch with you know with your platform to help create you know community grants for people to start creating content or for people to do you know bug bounties and other things that normally projects have to do on their own, right? You know, if it's smart contract based, especially, they're just gonna have to build the thing and then put it out there and figure it, everything out, which is something you guys could do very, very easily, I would say. Def yeah, like the whole launch pad ecosystem side of things, like pretty much every week, the, the thing that I love the most about it is like we're running TrustSwap very much as like a, a, a DAO in it, like not full scale DAO, but like community has ideas and they bring them to us and we're like, that's a great idea. And then like, you know, 24 hours later, there it is on the website. Um, so like all these things that people have been bringing, like for example, I think, yeah, yesterday's they were like, yo, like A-A-V-E, uh, however you pronounce it. They're like, they're doing mortgages. Like imagine if we could kind of link that in the trust swap ecosystem. We're like, that's an unreal idea. We are gonna be hopping on a call with them and trying to hash something out. So like all, all these ideas, like it's, it's just been very, very fun. And the coolest thing is, that most of this stuff is just software too. So it's not like we're spreading ourselves too thin. It's like, oh, you guys, like just like stay in your little niche vertical. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're gonna be way too busy. It's like, well, it's just software. And so this, like the software just does, obviously you need biz dev guys to like get people to use the software and like, you know, actively reach out and make those right. connections. But yeah, it's a, it's a scalable system. So I've really been enjoying the process of like the community interacting and like giving suggestions like that.
but yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I, I think that there's definitely a need for things like this in the space, you know, and it's in the name, you know, being able to trust a team that is, you know, dropping tokens or building a project. It's something that's been missing for, for a while. Like even, even projects that are very popular and have a, like an avid fan base, like Chainlink. Yeah. I remember maybe it was over a year ago now that where there was like this worry because some developers on the team dropped, you know, dumped a bunch of tokens. And so people were like, what's going on? You know, what is this a pump and dump scheme? And in reality, it was innocuous, but there's that fear factor with every project that something's going on that you don't know about. Exactly. Yeah. And so if we can just like make all this transparent, have everything like really segmented and yeah, like team token locks here, 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 um, mm -hmm. maybe a, a cool little leak that we're, we're talking with a, a project right now. And because when you look at public markets, all financials are transparent for a publicly traded company on the stock market. And isn't it a little crazy that in crypto, we don't have that. I get on the individual side that we have the power to be anonymous. And I think that's really important that the individual has that power. I don't necessarily think that the company should be anonymous and hide all their transactions since we're investing in them. I mean, yeah, da, 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 utility token, not a security, whatever. But um, yeah. I think it's important that these guys show this. And so we're in talks with a, a platform right now that everything that kind of goes through the launch pad, they're also going to have metadata attached to all of their transactions from their company wallets. So investors can go in at any time and be like, okay, like this was spent for this marketing, this went to this guy, this went to this guy. And the thing that I'm the most excited about is like, it's just, it's gonna paint an entirely new gold standard for how token sales go with the token launches, uh, yeah. sorry, the token locks with the, um, the DICO and with the transparent accounting. It's like how, like I got goosebumps, man. I, that's the maybe nerdiest shit that I have goosebumps from that. But uh, Not at all. yeah, I, I just think it's super cool. Like now people can have like an incredibly de-risked investment opportunity. Yeah, and that's, I think that will, that will draw away a lot of the criticism that comes from traditional, traditional markets and, and individuals, even like retail investors who are like, I, I'm not going to touch crypto because I don't know what's going on. You know, like there's yeah. so much, so much that went wrong in 2017, 2018, which is a totally fair criticism. Uh, but I agree with you being able to see behind the curtain, you know, with bit like, especially with big ICOs, like EOS, for example, or right. Like, it's like that's, a massive ICO where it's like the big moves that they make, like buying a domain for X, you know, X number thirty of dollars. million dollars. Yeah, like you can tell that they did that, but like, where's the other money going? Yeah, I mean, I know just from you know speaking to people, like they've spent a lot on the like regulatory side, which sure. all projects are having to do, but being able to see behind behind the scenes and see where money like where your money is going is is definitely important. Yeah. And you know, I think it's fine that some projects opt out of that. Like I don't think that it's like every project needs to have transparent accounting. Like yeah. that's not what I'm saying, but I am saying that maybe it raises a yellow flag if a project opts out of that option. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, in a like I guess in a lean team where you don't have very many people and you're going to you're going to like I'm going to be heads down we're not going to buy anything like we're not going to make any capital investment in anything but dev right maybe you don't need to do it right but if you're going to be building like marketing organization and spinning up a you know a nonprofit on the side like these things you have to be able to to show mm -hmm. so yeah i mean this is a i think we're finally getting to the point now like we're starting to develop to this to this point where crypto is starting to be ready for more adoption like mm -hmm. I, people were calling for adoption in 2018 like it, it it wasn't even close like we're starting to get there now i think in terms of infrastructure definitely yeah yeah like 2017 2018 it was just like massive amounts of money flooding in yeah. no kind of like foundational thing everyone was just tossing ideas into the wind and i mean to some extent i think that's still fairly true to this day and i still think that like everyone's like oh that's we're never going to repeat that one again and then you know here we go people like dumping bajillions of dollars into yam and tendies yeah. you know what i mean so it's like ah i i think we'll we'll never learn our lesson and there'll always be new money learning like doing the same mistakes over and over and over but uh over okay. time, I'm, I'm excited to see the infrastructure continue to build out and evolve. And it's certainly been taking a lot longer than I expected it would in, in a lot of different ways, like just the user friendliness. I'm like, like MetaMask, I think is like a pretty, pretty good 
And like Ledger is pretty good, but they're also both terrible when you really think about like how complex yeah. they are. So comparatively, exactly. Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah, I'm looking I forward agree. to things getting a lot simpler in that regard because, oh man, yeah, even using like Ledger is like, in my opinion, the most recognized device. And at least I'd, I'd say one tenth of the time when I go to use my Ledger, something's wrong. And it's like, you know, I update it and then yeah. it still doesn't work. And then I'm looking on Reddit because there's no support section on their website and you can't email them. Yeah. I'm like, how is any, I'm like yeah. how is anybody going to get into crypto ledger you're you're effing us here <laughs> yeah i mean that was actually the original like that was the original niche for my channel it was like people had issues with ledger right i've got you i've got the answers i figured this stuff out for you that's like, unreal yeah i mean and there's such an appetite for it like the the searchability of those topics speak for themselves like yeah. people go and if something doesn't work, like even if it's innocuous, it's like connectivity, like you're, you're not connected to Wi-Fi, you people panic because there's so much money in, in these devices. Sure. To people, you know? Yeah. And then the also the, the concept that like people don't know how to extricate themselves from the cl like classical mindset that like you have the money, the money is not in the ledger, sure. right? Like it's it's the keys, right? Yeah. And so that's another one that's really big that people I think get super worried about they're like oh, what if i lose this I, do i lose everything it's like not <laughs> if you have good backup practices you know exactly yeah but yeah again such a confusing thing like you mentioned for people like i think yeah. i think what would be one of the best adoption things for crypto is if like they're you know like best buy i don't know if anyone's like best buy is like it's like computer store but if they had a geek squad they have a geek squad they set yeah. up like tvs and shit for best buy but if they had that for crypto so somebody who comes to your house just sets you up, gets you your ledger, puts it in your safe, and is like, here's my phone number. If you want to do anything, call me. Give but, me a ring. Exactly, but just know that it's safe. And like the instructions are in there. If any like if I die or whatever, you know what I mean? But I think I think we need a crypto yeah. geek squad. And I think that would just blow up and it's super scalable. So I hope somebody builds that. Yeah. I mean so even it's like even something that's respectful of the like sensitivity. It's like if you need help setting up the ledger yeah you don't have to show you don't have to show me anything but i can sit there and i can be on a call with you yes. and i can walk you through it like when something pops up that you don't get like we can ex i can explain it i agree it would be huge <laughs> and like a a custody a self-custody consulting firm yes <laughs> very much so yeah contract data on web web you know web interface off it's like yeah like how unuser friendly is that Anyways, yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, no, the wild world, man, and and I think everybody, everybody in this space that is learning continuously is getting better at, at handling this and helping other people figure it out as they come in. So I think we're in a much better place now than we were in 2017 in terms of the volume of people who who quote unquote get it, yeah, and can help the newcomers this time around. You know, do things right. 100%. Yeah, everything's headed in the right direction, but it's uh, adoption is just as volatile as the prices, I feel. Totally, totally. You know, it only takes a couple things to go wrong and for all the newcomers to bow out all at once because of, uh, you know, because of panic. And that's happened several times in the past. So mm -hmm. it's always something to consider, but largely, you know, DeFi being one, you know, generally new forms of token standards being another, and then platforms that have been talked about for five years now starting to hit mainnet and deliver on their their, you know, lofty papers and goals. Sure, I think is going to be the the catalyst for a lot of a lot of uh, new entrants for sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Because I mean, like EOS has been around for a while, and they like oh free transactions and yada yada. So it's like, well, let's see. What, let's because I'm assuming you're talking about Cardano. So it's like, well, let's see what Cardano can do. Yeah, and like Elrond and like sure. others that have just been you know kind of floating. Zilliqa is another one that has potential, right. but like they were just missing scripting language stuff. Like they didn't have a real robust smart contract mechanism. So it was like, okay, let's see what you can do now that they have a language that's more more built out than it used to be right so competition's great i, I mean especially even for even for eth 2.0 totally like they have they have the hardest job in the space by far i like i campaign this all the time like it is the hardest job to make something backwards compatible and better in every way than right. the last thing that you built you know <laughs> that's fair yeah and so it's like 
I equate it to like imagine having to re-architect the internet today without breaking with breaking as little stuff as possible that exists now. Like it's not easy to do. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, people use the metaphor like changing a plane's wings mid-flight. And I'm not a dev, yeah. but I that, that analogy kind of like, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, it's sound. I mean, like you have to build, you'll probably, you have to build the new thing while the old thing's still working. And then you have to remove the old thing whilst still flying with the new thing <laughs> and fixing bugs there, you know? Yeah. So... Yeah, it'll be it'll be a wild ride, but I think 2021 is going to be a, a year to remember for a lot of people that have been in crypto for a long time, and even people that are just getting into it. Totally, yeah, I'm I'm excited for the year ahead. I think uh, I'm optimistic. You know, we just broke twelve thousand today on the Bitcoin, and uh, mm -hmm. I think price moves sentiment and the market a massive amount. So I'm expecting some pretty damn good things in the next few months. I'm excited. Hey, likewise, man. Likewise. Right. But Jeff, uh, just for attention span purposes, I know I don't have that long of an attention span. So yep. I want to keep this keep this short. But honestly, thanks so much for joining. I'm glad we could get this done. And, and I would love to uh, to do this again in the next couple of months when we have some, uh, some more good topics to talk about. Totally, man. Would love that. I appreciate you having me on. 100%, 100%. And really quickly, before we sign off, where can folks find you on social media? Uh, yeah, just hit me up on Twitter, at Jeff Kurdekis, um, K-I-R-D-E-I-K-I-S. Um, that's a good one. Awesome. But uh, also, find me on Uptrend. That's, uh, maybe that's the one that you Perfect. can get me on. Awesome. Well, I'll leave those links down below for anyone that's interested. And as always, guys, thanks so much for watching. Have a fantastic rest of your week slash weekend. Cheers.